According to a recent study, nearly half of American women struggle with hormone imbalance. And in my practice, this number is much higher because most physicians don't take the time to really delve into proper hormonal testing. So what gives? Why do so many women struggle with hormone issues? And why do these issues so often go undetected by medical professionals? My guest today says you not only can help balance your hormones, but use them as your secret superpower. And as a result, enjoy better relationships, better bodies, better sex life, and better minds. She's Dr. Stephanie Estima, a chiropractor with a special interest in functional neurology, metabolism, and body composition. She's also the creator of the Estima Diet, host of the Better Podcast, and author of The Betty Body. We're about to cover a lot of important topics as Dr. Estima shares her approach to healing, modern science mixed with ancient wisdom to help you or the woman in your life find health. So welcome to the Dr. Gundry Podcast, Dr. Estima. It's great to have you on. I am thrilled to be here. Thank you for having me. So let's start with your book, The Betty Body, that came out earlier this year. Okay, I got, I got to know, what is a Betty Body? <laughs> yeah, this is a this is a point of confusion, um, and maybe this is a, a fallacy in my marketing. But the we started a, a podcast in at the end of 2019. The name of the podcast is Better with Dr. Stephanie, and the fans of our show we started just lovingly calling them our Betties, and it was very very sticky. They started you know calling themselves Betties, and I want to be a Betty, and I want to learn how to be better, and I'm a Betty. And we looked up the definition of a Betty in the Urban Dictionary, and turns out there's a definition for it. And I put this in the book, but the, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, but a Betty is a modern day queen. She's a fully embodied woman. She's quirky. She's loving. She's intelligent. She's excited about becoming, you know, the best version of herself in every way. And when I saw that definition, I said, oh my gosh, like that's, I'm that person, you know, I'm quirky and I'm loving and I'm aspiring to be the best version of myself. So we named the book, the book is called The Betty Body after our fans and after the pursuit of just trying to love and accept and uh, optimize the body that you live in. So it's not, you know, it's size agnostic. I'm not trying to tell you that you need to look like a size two or a size, you know, whatever size. It's really about loving the skin that you're in and optimizing, you know, we'll talk about today, your hormones and, you know, your metabolism and working on your body composition. So it's really about being the best version of yourself in the body, in, you know, in the meat sack that we all live in. All right. Yeah, I, I was trying to figure out if you were referring to there was a cartoon character in the 30s. The Flintstones. Betty, well, Betty Boop, actually, oh, long, Betty long Boop, before right. Betty Rebel. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's right. That's yeah. right. Uh, so, and, and she, was, uh, she was kind of an, an epitome of the perfect proportioned woman, I guess. So it would be yeah. um, whatever. All right. So in the book, you share a lot of your personal story about health and emotional struggles. Uh, can you explain what you mean when you were at war with your body? Yeah, this was part of the, you know, the birth process of, you know, the, the book and my own story in that, um, you know, for years, I really looked at my own menstrual cycle as this really pesky, you know, punishment for being a woman that came every month. It was really annoying. I often medicated, uh, you know, I was taking lots and lots of Midol and lots and lots of medications to really silence the symptoms that my body was trying to tell me. And, um, partly because in schooling, even though I was in, you know, I was, my undergrad is in neuroscience and psychology. My professional degree, as you mentioned, doctor of chiropractic, you know, we're not really taught about fertility. I mean, we have the basic, like this is a female menstrual cycle. Um, but we're not really taught about our fertility. And I think in society so often we're really taught to fear, um, our fertility as well. So, um, I would, um, you know, every month, uh, and I, I talk about this in the book, uh, you know, when I would be going in to see patients, when I knew it was that time of the month where I would be in my, you know, week one or my bleed week, needed to take multiple pairs of pants, needed to schedule lots of breaks in between patients because of the discomfort that I was in. And it really wasn't until uh, I had a couple of, 
you know, major life events sort of happen at the same time, um, was going through a, you know, divorce with very young children and my clinic actually burnt down. Uh, I, I don't know if I put that in the book, but my clinic burnt down and I had to rebuild it from, uh, the ground up and you do that in, you know, at the same time as going through a divorce. I mean, I'm great friends with the father of my children now, but I don't care what way you slice the divorce. Yeah. At that time it was really stressful, not sleeping very well, et cetera. But it wasn't really until I went on this, um, trip with my family to Italy where I really experienced what it, what it meant to have proper menstruation and how quickly I could actually turn that around. And I know, I know we'll talk a little bit about that, but, um, for me, for years, it was just, you know, my period, my menstrual cycle was just a punishment for being a woman. That's sort of how I looked at it without really understanding that these, these were the, my body's way of saying like, Hey girl, you know, like something's wrong here. I just, I just need you to pay a little bit more attention to me. So, yeah. So, yeah, you mentioned that this kind of wake up call happened in Italy, which is one of my favorite places in the world. And I just returned from there uh, two weeks ago, um, hiking in the hills above Portofino. So what happened in Italy that, you know, that was, you know, that turned things around? Did you eat better or sleep better or all of the above? All of the above and more. I mean, when, you know, I, and someone who loves Italy, um, as I do, I, I always feel like whenever I go there, like everything's better, like the coffee's better, even the little like mom, pa shops selling sandwiches, like everything is just better there. And what I did was I got a lot of natural sunlight, right? So we were, we went in the summertime, so would spend lots and lots of time at the beach. I would sleep, I would sleep in, I would go to sleep when it was dark. I would, I would wake up when it was light, uh, lots of natural low level movement. So we would, you know, wasn't necessarily following a very, you know, Estima diet. We'll talk about what the Estima diet is, not a very Estima diet friendly diet in Italy. I was enjoying the pastas and the gelatos and the, you know, the pizzas and stuff, but a lot of post prandi, a lot of post meal walking. So we would walk to the place that we were going to have our supper and then we'd walk, you know, along the beach, we'd walk in the town, we'd go to the little, you know, square where all the action was. So a lot of low level movement. And these were two main, you know, coupled with, you know, being able to sleep and lowering my stress and not having to, you know, not moving so much during, you know, in, in my practice days, all of these together in aggregate over the course of just one, like towards the end of that trip in Italy, we were there for about three weeks. Last week um, of the trip, I, I got my period. And normally this would be the worst thing that could ever happen. Like I would be holed up in the hotel room, you know, mask on, lights off, you know, drugged up, but it was beautiful. It was easy. It was graceful. I didn't have, you know, no excess heavy bleeding, all of that, that was really plaguing me for, you know, really decades before. And I really was curious about if I could, t I mean, like I said, everything's better in Italy, but if you could take some of those basic fundamentals around health, low level movement, like generalized movement through the day, sunlight, um, getting outside in fresh air, sleeping, uh, you know, in accordance with the, when the sun is down, you're inside, the lights are low, and then you wake up with the sunrise. Um, and I brought all of those things back to North America, where I live. I live in Toronto, um, so major Canadian city. And I really wanted to experiment, both with myself and my female patients. So I was already at that time running a nutrition program. It was ketogenic in its um, flavor and already noticing a difference in outcomes and prognoses from my male uh, cohort versus my female uh, cohort. Like men were like, this is like the best thing ever. Just dropping 20 pounds, like just blinking and like it's gone. And um, so started experimenting both with myself, like N of one, and then extending that experiment to um, the female patients that, uh, that, uh, that would let me. So we started playing around with their macronutrients and like some of the basics that we talked about, like circadian fasting and circadian, like getting movement in the morning, making sure you're being exposed to sunlight first thing in the morning, sleeping, making sure the lights are dark in the evening, all of those things. And that's part of the origin story of the book. That's why, you know, the methodology exists and I wanted to put it into a book for people to consume. All right. So you meant, that's interesting that you're, your male patients were, you know, going, wow, this ketogenic guy is great. You know, 20 pounds fell off in, yeah. in, in a day and a half. And I'm uh, joking about that. 
and your female patients are going, hey, wait a minute, that's, uh, that's not what I'm experiencing, and, you know, and, and I hate my husband, because uh, you know, <laughs> he, you know, he does this and it works. And yeah. So, and I've, I've certainly seen that as well in, in my practice, that uh, men seem to respond to this, just as a general rule, much better than most of my female patients, and we can go into that. But, you know, um, hormone imbalances, both in men and women, uh, seem to be rampant today. And uh, any, any thoughts on why that is? Did you, I mean, any part of your wake-up call motivate you to figure out, okay, why is everybody so screwed up right now in their hormones? It's, it's an interesting question. I think for our males, our beautiful male population, what we're seeing is we're seeing more of this estrogenization of them. So we see this lowering year over year. The data is very clear that their te our testosterone levels in our men um, are falling and we're seeing a lot more uh, irregularities in their sperm, uh, more so than would be considered normal, not only in sperm count, but in the quality of the sperm. And then with women, of course, we're seeing you know, kind of a whole, ga a whole gamut of, uh, you know, uh, of things. We're seeing things like estrogen dominance in our, uh, women who are in their perimenopausal years. And even before that, I, I, I have seen a lot of women in their thirties, myself included, I, I would put myself, you know, before I really discovered this way of living, having just terrible periods, terrible menstrual cycles. Um, and then we also see, you know, more of a testosterone of women as well. We're seeing this androgen dominance through, um, you know, categories like PCOS, which is polycystic ovary syndrome for your listeners who are not familiar with that, where a woman has a heart, she either has too much testosterone, free testosterone circulating in her system, or she's having trouble moving the testosterone into estrogen, which is, you know, just the natural you know, way of things. We make testosterone and then testosterone gets converted into estrogen. And that's true for men and women. And I think there's, you know, there's a lot of different verticals that we can explore. I think that there's a huge amount of stress in this modern day life. Uh, and stress can be, you know, I talk about this in the book, you can really divide stress into like you stress and distress, like good stress and bad stress. And we're very, a very sedentary populace. So we, you know, sit and talk to our computers all day long, you know, and you add in the pandemic where everyone's sheltering in place and sheltering at home, not getting a lot, a lot of that low level, um, general movement that I was talking about that I was experiencing a lot of in Italy, you get, you know, sort of this, reversal of light, right? So we tend to, we're all told, put on your sunglasses when you go outside, like make sure you get your sunglasses on, protect yourself from this evil thing called the sun. So we all have our sunglasses on. We have this sort of toxic sunscreen, which is maybe another, another conversation. Um, and then at, in the evening, we are exposing ourselves to this really bright blue light via the television or our phones or our devices. So there's almost this reversal in light exposure that I think is affecting, you know, a, a vast multitude of, of sins. But, in, you know, one of the most important ones is sleep. Like I think most of my women that I work with complain of some type of dysregulated sleep on a regular basis. So what that means is that they may be able to have like, you know, one, two, maybe three good nights in a week, but there are multiple bouts of insomnia or, you know, they have a hard time initiating sleep or maintaining sleep. So they, their mind, they'll say like, my mind is like, I feel tired, but my mind is racing like this tired and wired, um, presentation. So I think that there's, and then there's the whole conversation around, you know, endocrine disrupting chemicals, um, that are being put in, you know, we are exposed to plastics and in our food and the soil is nutrient devoid now. And we have, you know, I think, um, I believe it was Dr. Mark Hyman who said we only have, you know, 60 more harvests, something like that before the soil is, you know, completely dead and is just sand. So I think that there's a, a lot of different uh, a lot of different ways why we are stressed. And I know stress is such a sort of umbrella term where it's like, well, what does that even mean? But it can be physical stress, chemical stress, emotional stress um, that is really weighing in on our physiology and, and on our biology as well. Yeah, I, I, I agree with all those. And certainly I've written uh, about almost every one of those subjects in, in my books. And so yeah. I agree with you. 
And one of the things that you noticed when you were in Italy, and it's certainly true in, in many of the European uh, countries that I visit, is this idea of walking, uh, walking uh, particularly after meals. And uh, I mean, you see it in Barcelona on the Ramblas, uh, you, you see it in Italy, people, you know, after a meal, they don't, you know, just go sit on the couch and watch TV. Um, there, and, and we do that. We walk to dinner, we actually choose a, a fairly far away place and walk there and then walk back, even though we'd rather not in, in a way. Uh, but it's very typical. And if you, look at, if you look at the blue zones that Dan Butner has described, and I spent most of my career in the only blue zone in North America, La Melinda, uh, California, uh, they're all in actually hilly cities. Uh, every one of these blue zones is, is in hills. And one of the things they do, and certainly I've visited a number of these cities, is they walk. They, they walk up the hills, they walk down the hills, and just walking is so useful, particularly after meals or before meals. And in fact, there's a very famous study I wrote about in my first book long ago. They had people walk 10 minutes before they ate dinner versus walking 10 minutes after they ate dinner and literally compared weight loss. And it turns out the people who walked before dinner had no change in their weight. And the people who walked after dinner actually lost weight. And I, uh, I postulated that it was almost like you had gone on a hunt and you, you hunted and you, you ate and they said, okay, you captured the food you ate, we're gonna store whatever you ate. But if you eat and then walk, your genes say, oh, what the heck, you know, we're at it again. We shouldn't store this stuff. We're going to use it up. And yeah, I, and I think these cultures have figured out, you know, some of these secrets that when you think about it seem fairly obvious. And what you're saying is, I mean, it's 100% true. And it's such a powerful when we think about these blue, uh, you know, these blue areas, these blue zones we're talking about powerful ways to modulate glucose regulation. That is one of the best ways. If you have, if you are someone who struggles, if you are, you know, on the spectrum, maybe you have metabolic syndrome, or even if you have type two diabetes, one of the best things that you can do is go for a walk after your meal, as you very well know, and you just beautifully described the study. Cause what's happening is you have these big muscles, your leg muscles, your back muscles are keeping you erect. You have that contralateral arm and leg movement. And so you're, the food that you've just eaten is being broken down into these constituents, which now can be thrown into the muscles, right? Into the big, mu these legs and back and everything. And of course we know that once those, like once glucose gets into the muscle, it can't get out again. So it stays there to be able to be used as a substrate for energy for the musculoskeletal system. So yeah, I just wanted to, like, I just love it. It's one of the things I think we get wrong in North America. We are very much movement specialists, right? Like we get the, you know, not, like not throwing sun, like not blowing, you know, shade at Peloton or whatever, but we get on our Peloton bikes and we get on our, you know, we do this one class for an hour and it's a super high into, maybe it's CrossFit once they open up again or whatever. We do this <laughs> very high intensity work for one hour or maybe an hour and a half. And then we sit for the rest of the day, right? Whereas these European cultures or these blue zones, as you're describing, have a lot of lower level Move, general movement through the day, like the gardening and the tending to the tomatoes and the walking to the plaza and the walking to the butcher. We don't really get that. I mean, at least um, there are some pedestrian cities, I think, in North America. You know, I would say that um, San Francisco might be one of them. New York might be another. But for the most part, we're driving cities, right? We drive to the grocery store. We drive to pick up our kids. We drive, you know, we're driving all the time, which is another form of being sedentary. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, it, it is interesting, uh, people who live in large cities, and Toronto is certainly a large city, uh, tend to have, as a general rule, lower weights than people who live in the suburbs because, like New York, for example, uh, when we're in New York, we, we will, whether we want to or not, walk five to 10 miles a day. Uh, we don't take the subway, we don't take cabs, we just walk. And, and even if you do take subways, you end up walking uh, usually right. a considerable distance to your office or whatever. 
So yeah, there's something, cities should have been better designed for walking. Now the problem with Toronto is too cold, you know, I mean, come <laughs> on, get over it, would you? You need to move. <laughs> it does get cold in the winter, I, I'll give you that, yep. <laughs> All right, so uh, let me, I'm gonna throw out a, a patient from this week, and she's actually a physician, and she's been seeing a hormone specialist She's 46, and that's all I'll tell you about her. Uh, this is the first time I met her. And she was seeing a hormone specialist um, because, uh, let's just say, she lacked libido. Um, and so I looked at her hormone panel, and uh, she has uh, she, her, her FSH, and for those people who are wondering, that's follicle-stimulating hormone. And it's a good way of telling uh, is perimenopause approaching, are you in menopause, but. So she's on hormone replacement and she's got an estrogen of 395, I remember this distinctly because it was two days ago. She has a testosterone of 996 with a free testosterone of over 20. And wow. Wow. Mm. And I went, um, how long has this been going on? And she said, well, uh, it, it's been about a year now. Um, so I, I won't tell you any more about the conversation. What do you think about that for hormone replacement, for libido in a woman? So she's complaining of low libido. Yeah, this is how she got started on okay. hormone replacement. Um, so this I is not think a test. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate the, um, I, I love talking clinical cases. I think that when... And she's currently on, just so I'm clear, she's currently on hormone replacement therapy. She's on estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. Okay. So I think when it comes to a woman and HRT or even bioidenticals, um, before that is a conversation that is even breached or, you know, broached with the patient, I think that there's value in making sure that there's some foundational basics that are, um, that are in place. So one is going to be that she has proper, uh, that she, irrespective of her genetics and the way that she's processing her estrogen, um, we want to make sure that we can amplify her liver detoxification, which is one of the main stays in terms of how estrogen is metabolized. And there's a couple of different, um, without getting into the weeds of like, you know, two hydroxy estrogen and four hydro, we want to be, we want to be promoting, there's three main metabolites of estrogen metabolism. We want to be promoting the antagonist, which is the two OH pathway, which is the metabolite that does not retain the ability to continue to activate the estrogen receptor. The other thing you want to think about is lean body mass, right? How much muscle does this woman have? She's 46. So she's sort of right in this like smack in the middle of perimenopause. And even though she's still cycling, we want to make sure that we can increase her lean muscle mass such that she is going to a, you know, kind of back to what we were saying with those blue zones, be a, a sufficient and uh, or efficient glucose disposal agent via more muscle mass. Um, so we want to be thinking about resistance training. There's going to be maybe some cardiovascular component in there, but the mainstay there is like lifting weights. And I think that we also want to get things like stress and sleep under control. Um, and light viewing behavior. I mean, we can talk about the brain, you know, what happens in the brain when you get like early morning light in terms of the retinal ganglion. Except we won't go down that like nerd uh, pathway, but I think that some of these foundations have to be in place before we consider hormonal replacement ther th uh, therapy. Because what can happen like it seems is happening in this patient is we're getting a lot of testosterone that is not necessarily being aromatized into estrogen and her estrogen at 395 that's you know that's high you know we want to be thinking about and i'm assuming this is like picograms per milliliter that's yeah. you know it's you know an estrogen in a woman same with testosterone is going to be cycle dependent but now we have this accumulation of excess hormones in this woman's body and her body it doesn't sound like knows or efficiently knows what to do with it so I'm a big fan of HRT. Like I'm a big, I think that the Women's Health Initiative got it completely ass backwards. Um, I'm a big fan of it if it can help augment 
a woman's perimenopausal and menopausal symptoms. But I think before we bridge that subject with her, we want to be thinking about how we can directionally already optimize some of these pathways, these hormonal pathways that I was just describing, like the estrogen metabolism. How can we get her going down that protective pathway? How can we be increasing her lean muscle mass so that we can improve her glucose disposal agent and also maintain natural levels of testosterone? You know, if she's a poor aromatizer, which it sounds like, you know, maybe with the tea at 996 and the estrogen at 395, maybe we have a problem with aromatization, right? Like maybe we want to be thinking thinking about how we can, there's ways that we can help amplify that through the diet, taking in lots of green leafy vegetables that have compounds like indoles and diindole methane, and then the sulforaphanes, which are going to help with that um, conjugation um, piece in um, uh, estrogen metabolism. So um, yeah, I mean, I don't know her. There's a lot of context that I would, that I would like to have in terms of her lifestyle, but that would be my initial thoughts on on that woman. Well, I like what you said, uh, and maybe I think that's the point we ought to emphasize. I think, and I, I agree with the, the same premise, before we go down a hormone replacement pathway, uh, we need to find out, you know, exactly what the, how that person is number one, producing the hormones they're producing, and number Correct. two, how they're metabolizing them. And I agree with you that so many times, um, particularly in, in, uh, in my male, male patients and my PCOS patients, um, I, ha I see a lot of men with low T, and they're usually highly estrogen dominant. And they're, they're carbohydrate eaters to beat the band, they're insulin resistant, uh, they may not have been diagnosed as pre-diabetic because unfortunately in the United States, almost nobody measures a fasting insulin. And um, so anyhow, those guys, I can always get their testosterone and their free testosterone normalized just by changing their food, doing resistance training. Same way with my females who have PCOS. A ketogenic diet and strength training just does miraculous jobs for for this in general. So I love what you're saying. Let's let's work with the person first, and then if we need to, then we can titrate in you know what we can't accomplish with with food and lifestyle. Is that paraphrasing you correctly? That would be spot on. Absolutely. I think that these foundational basics of nutrition and resistance training, appropriate rest and recovery, these are all things that we need to be considering before we, you know, I would say that any type of exogenous medication, whether it's, you know, a, a hormone or it's a, you know, it's a, ster it's a, ster whatever it is, a corticosteroid, whatever it is. Um, these are all unnatural to the body. And we want to be able to optimize the, the way that we process the way that we naturally process, have our own pathways processing. And then when we take these exogenous substances, we want to be able to optimize again, the, you know, the, uh, processing of the, uh, the desired effect of those medications. All right. I want to backtrack for a second, because I think this is, this is going to be very interesting to, uh, to my listeners. I know most of my female patients don't feel like this, but I think it's interesting that you mention in your book that a woman's menstrual period, when understood properly, is a superpower. Mm -hmm. um, so, and you also talk about that menopause can be turned into a superpower. So I think that's, I think that's fascinating. And, you know, give, give our listeners the pitch on why menstruation and menopause could be superpowers that you should uh, embrace. Yeah, that's, thank you for, thank you for bringing this point up. I think that, um, you know, I've been talking a little bit about, um, you know, with our conversation, how I used to really hate my own cycle. I thought it was really punitive and I just thought it was this big, you know, rigmarole for nothing every month. And it was only after Italy and then came, coming back to Toronto, working with my patients, where I actually started to really look forward to, it was almost like a report card. I was like, what is my hormonal report card going to be like this month? And I think that when we, when you understand the ebbs and flows of your ever-changing hormonal milieu, because as women in, in our reproductive years, this includes my perimenopausal ladies, 
we are, we have a different hormonal composition every single day of the month. So that is going to have profound effects on, you know, what we should be eating, how we should be moving, what our mood is going to look like, our energy levels are going to look like, you know, our, um, receptivity, uh, our libido, you know, so our receptivity to sex and whether or not we are interested in, in it at all. And all of these things are really important to consider for a woman's health. There's also, you know, I go into a lot of detail in the book around, you know, estrogen receptor. There's basically estrogen receptors almost everywhere. You know, there's areas in the brain that are very sensitive, particularly these, uh, areas around verbal acuity and, you know, being able to pull, you know, and be able to, you know, f floss your vernacular, if you will. So there's certain times of the month where you are much more, you are much better suited to, you know, give a podcast, you know, be on a podcast like this or give a presentation or ask for a raise. You know, there's different times of the month where we are just, we have that slight edge because of that hormonal composition that we are currently experiencing. So I think once you get to understand your ebbs and flows, like when you are more introverted and it's time to sink into your body, when you're more extroverted and it's time to network and chat and, you know, ask for that raise, once you understand that, this is what I'm talking about in terms of a superpower. I try to schedule most of my talking uh, when I need to be giving a presentation or speaking as I am with you now. I try to uh, schedule it around week two of my cycle and into week three because I know that we have estrogen bathing my brain in these articulation centers. Um, I know that I'm a little bit more extroverted. You know, I tend, I tend to kind of skew introverted normally, but week two, I'm like super happy. I love everybody. People are good, you know? <laughs> so, um, these little nuances in understanding where you are emotionally and physiologically, I think can have profound effects on your enjoyment in your life. And the same is true also in menopause. You know, we used to, and I, first I just want to say, you know, I think that we, we tend to forget about menopausal women. You know, we've been talking about menstrual cycles and I'm happy to go into as much detail as you'd like, but menopausal women are often forgotten about. Right. And even we see this in like Hollywood, we see, you know, there we have, we're devoid of sexuality. As soon as we turn 50, it's like, you know, we all wear like cardigan sweaters and you know, whatever. I mean, there's not, I have not, no beef with cardigan sweaters, but you know, like th there's just no, uh, zest for life, you know, and this, you know, you and I, it sounds like you have a love for uh, European culture as I do. And there's a certain, you know, the Greeks say there's a certain like Zoe, like a certain like Zoe, zest for life that I think is portrayed as lost once we move into menopause. And I completely reject that. I think that all of the energy that we put in every month as, as women in our menstrual years towards the development of this endometrial lining, you can now take that energy because it's no longer happening in your reproductive cycle. And you can use that to call into your life the things that are most important to you. And it's likely if you're a 55 or, you know, you're a menopausal woman, whatever age that happens for you, that you've been spending likely decades taking care of other people, your children, your, you know, your career, your husband or your partner. And so this is a time of almost reclamation where you can say, okay, I'm going to do what's really good for my soul. I'm going to make sure that I do, I do what's good for me. And so you can take this, you know, the, the, almost sometimes the roller coaster that can happen in, in the reproductive cycle and then move that into energy that you want to create. And even though you don't have, you know, uh, ovaries, you know, you don't have a womb that can be reproductive. You can still be very productive. You can be cre you can use that, you know, I, I call in the book, I talk about, you know, your womb space being this like all chemical, you know, pr like prowess, like you can use your womb space to create and call in the things that you love. So that's a little bit, that's a little woo woo. That's me kind of getting into my feminine a little bit, but I, I feel, I really feel strongly about that. Well, speaking, speaking of, you know, getting into feminine, I know you've seen, and I've certainly seen in my practice, that there, there are a certain percentage of women, and we can maybe argue uh, what that percentage is, that their brain is so dependent on a little touch of estrogen that when their estrogen finally, you know, gives up the boat, uh, and most women will stop making estrogen unless they're making it out of their fat stores and we could get into that but uh, i find that a small amount of topical you know estradiol i mean 
tiny amounts, just, uh, just, just enough to even you know, measure in picograms, all of a sudden they'll, you know, they'll come back six weeks later and go, that was it. I mean, that's yeah. it. You know, it. My brain works again. What the heck? Um, mm -hmm. Do you see that in your practice? I do. I think, and this is, you know, kind of what we were talking about before. I'm a big believer. I love bioidenticals. I think that they can be an incredibly powerful augment to a woman. And estrogen is, you know, as I was saying, we have estrogen receptors on our lungs. We have estrogen receptors everywhere. Um, it can, and I talk about this in the book as well, even our libido, right? Like a lot of women in their late forties and early and beyond, you know, we, we have this perception that their sexuality and their sensuality like that life is over. But part of that is because of a change in the hormonal composition. We have lowering T, we have lowering E, these are lowering estrogen or estradiol, as you were saying. And these are really important important for maintenance of the vaginal wall, for lubrication, for orgasm, you know? And so a lot of women will say, gosh, like my libido is just not what it, you know, my, my interest in sex, my receptivity to sex is really different. Um, and even penetrative sex is very painful. And this is where, you know, I think the topical cream is great. You can also do intravaginal, like you can do, um, uh, vaginal cream as well to help specifically with that. But I'm a big I'm a big fan of of bioidenticals, especially um, you know you can and a lot of times you can get them. I mean I don't recommend you do this, but you can get them from online retailers. I always recommend that you try to work with a functional medicine provider and so to help them like titrate the levels for you. But this is something that I think should be available to every woman if she needs it. All right, let's switch gears again. Uh, you mentioned that you were really uh, eating different in Italy and that eating and the lifestyle there seemed to play a big part in your transition. So you mm -hmm. created your own diet, and uh, can you summarize it for us? Absolutely, yeah, so there's two main, it's called the Estima diet, um, and there's two main phases of it. There's a phase one, which is a therapeutic intervention of a ketogenic diet, and I would say that the way that I formulate my ketogenic diet is much more female focused. I mean, men can do it as well, um, but I've made sure that we have an abundance of, you know, some of the, you know, the brassica genus, like we have lots of green leafy vegetables in there. It's not bacon, butter, burgers, and repeat. It's not tubs and tubs of sour cream, um, but there's a therapeutic intervention of ketosis that can be modified based on the person. Like I've had, um, you know, my autoimmune, like my, my ladies with, you know, Hashimoto's, I've had uh, multiple sclerosis, like patients with MS, we've extended this phase. So usually I, in the book, I talk about it being a 28 day cycle. So one cycle and then moving on to um, phase two, but some populations like my, my autoimmune women, I tend to keep them in phase one a little bit longer. So that's phase one. It's a 70-20-10. So it's 70% fat, 20% uh, protein, and 10% carbohydrates, with the carbohydrates being from like mainly green leafy vegetables. Proteins, um, I'm, I love meat. Um, you certainly can, um, you can, I give vegetarian options in there as well. Um, but love, uh, I, I love meat for a variety of reasons for women, you know, iron and, you know, full spectrum of B vitamins. You don't have to think about protein combining and all of that. Uh, however, you can also do it as a vegetarian. So that's phase one. Phase two is more cycling. So this is where we start to pair, we start to change the macronutrients if you are in your reproductive years, and we, 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 we do that in accordance with your menstrual cycle. So there are times in the month where you are much more resilient to carbohydrate restrict. So uh, in the book, I talk about, you know, your bleed week or week one of your cycle is a great time to play with the ketogenic diet. I also talk about fasting protocols to try in this week as well. In week two of your cycle, we um, we see a different hormonal composition in the woman. So we see testosterone rising, estrogen rising. These are anabolic hormones. So I like to help promote that um, by increasing the protein and the carbohydrates that week. So we will change from a 70-20-10 to a 40-40-20 or a 50-40-10, depending on the person. But for ease, we'll call it 40% fat, 40% 
protein, 20% carbohydrates. And the reason for that is I'm trying to activate these growth pathways. Um, so mammalian target of rapamycin is the main one that I'm after with that more protein and carbohydrate um, intake, which is involved in, you know, when you're having more protein, you're going to initiate something called muscle protein synthesis, which is kind of what it sounds like. It's making new muscle proteins. Very important for my ladies. We've been talking about resistance training as a proxy for helping with keeping testosterone levels at a, at a healthy level, at least directionally. You can also support that. You can also supplement when you're having more protein, you know, in the kitchen, you can make testosterone and muscles in the kitchen, um, by increasing your protein intake. But I also don't want that, you know, when we, the reason why we go in and out is I don't, I almost want to like hold mTOR, you know, that growth pathway. I want to kind of bring it down in those ketogenic weeks, like a spring, you know, and then I want to let it loose, um, for a week in week two. And then in, in week four, I talk about, uh, returning to that higher protein, higher carb, um, in week four. So we sort of are cycling in and out of growth. Um, but it's a strategic type of growth. Cause I like to pair the nutrition with a certain amount of activity, like certain types of activities, like resistance training and how you do that. So yeah, so we do keto in week one and three, and then protein, high protein, high carb in week two, and well, I'd say 20% carbs is, we'll call that moderate, uh, you know, moderate carb, higher protein in week two and four. And you say you're not going to eat a, a quart of sour cream and wash it down with a stick of butter. But, right. So yeah. where is your 70% fat coming from? Um, it's really, I am a big fan of monounsaturated fatty acids and, and polyunsaturated fatty acids. So MUFAs and PUFAs, um, as they're abbreviated and then saturated, you'll get saturated fat from the, you know, when you have, when you're, if you're a meat eater, you're going to not only be consuming protein and all the vitamins and stuff, but you get fat from that as well. Um, so avocados, um, olive oil, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a Mediterranean esque um, type of uh, type of fat where we're we're getting most of our fat from, and I talk about in the in the um, in the book, some people don't do well. You know, a typical traditional ketogenic diet is very high in the saturated fat realm, and I don't have a problem with saturated fat. There are some people who have a really hard time metabolizing um, SF. So what we do is we I tend to err on the side of caution, and I give you more of these mufas and pufas, so more olive oil and more avocados and avocado oils and and things like that. Um, but you will get, um, you will get some saturated fat from the animal protein. If you're a meat eater, you'll also get it from coconut uh, oil if you're consuming coconut oil as well. But we try to minimize the saturated fat. You mentioned fasting. Now there's, um, there's a lot of online fear mongering about fasting in women. So what say you doctor? <laughs> I, I'm a fan of fasting for women. I just think that it needs to be done intelligently. Um, there's been a lot of, um, it, there's been a lot of, uh, bizarre, uh, conclusions made about fasting that somehow it's an eating disorder or, you know, somehow, um, you know, not eating. And I, I actually would argue the opposite is true. I think that eating when you're when you're not hungry is the eating disorder. You know, we're just at that point, you're just soothing, right? You're just soothing yourself. Or you're trying to placate yourself. I think that fasting strategically for a woman can absolutely help um, with her growth hormone, with her testosterone levels, with her sleep, with if she's interested in weight loss or, you know, body recomposition and body recomping, I think it can be a very useful tool. And again, you know, as you are a woman in your perimenopausal and well, actually we haven't really spoken about this, but a, a woman in, as we age, we naturally become more insulin resistant, right? So we want to really be thinking about ways that we can increase our insulin sensitivity. Um, and one of the ways that you can do that is through carbohydrates carbohydrate restriction through keto, but you can also do that by restricting all macros, <laughs> you know, you can just fast. So I think that that's a really powerful way that we can sensitize ourselves to insulin. And then of course, if you are cycling, you know, if you are someone who is following that phase two of my program, when you do consume more carbohydrates, your body is going to be able to make use of that rather than your pancreas having to throw out a boatload of insulin, like your cells are be like, Oh, I haven't seen you in a week. Yes. I would love to have some, you know, I'd love to have more vegetables. Yes. And let me bring that into the cell. Um, so I, I think that we want to be thinking about fasting as a tool as we age, as something that is appropriate to help with insulin sensitization. And, um, 
you know, in the book I outline, I, I tend to look at fasting Uh, like three, you can sort of manipulate fasting variables in three different ways. You can change the type of fast. You can change the length of your fast and the frequency of your fast. So this is not to say that you should only just be doing a 24 hour fast all the time. I think that women in like, we want to always be sensitive because in the culture that we live in, at least I can speak to my experience as being a woman. It's very much like you must always look 25, no matter what, you know, like you always have to look a certain way. You have to be a certain size. So, um, I think that we want to be, um, we want to be sensitive to women who are, uh, using fasting potentially in a, and one of the contraindications that I outline in the book is, you know, a history of eating disorders is using fasting as a tool. But fasting can be really, really powerful for helping um, help reset the gut. You know, we know that the endothelial lining of the cells in the gut, they turn over every three to four days. You can completely help with the, we'll call it GI distress, you know, that can happen as we age, right? The distension, the bloating, you know, maybe belching or what have you. Um, so fasting can really help with that. And I outline, you know, water fasts. I also talk about bone broth fasting, um, as a way to help with the lumen of the gut as well. Cause there's a lot of, um, really powerful components in a bone broth, uh, in bone broth in general that can really help with, you know, closing up the hyperpermeability of the gut. Um, these payers patches that sort of these junctions that open up. Um, if you, if you have any of those, you know, GI symptoms that I talked about. Um, and again, you can pair it with your cycle. So there's going to be weeks that you are much more resilient and do, you can do much more aggressive fasts, like just a water only fast or a longer fast or a more free, you know, frequently, like more frequently fasting in that first week. And then there's times like in your luteal uh, phase of your cycle, the last two weeks of your cycle, where fasting aggressively is just, it's just going to be a miserable experience. So, you know, in, in, and we're actually not designed, especially in that fourth week, I talk about this in the book that, um, I really want gentle intermittent fasting that week. So it can be a daily time restricted eating protocol where maybe you're doing a 12, 12 or a 10, 14, or maybe even a 16, eight, um, but really just being a little gentler with yourself, your body is actually throwing in a lot of substrate into the endometrial lining. It's throwing in glucose, amino acids, free fatty acids, glutathione, vitamin D, selenium, zinc, all the things are going into your endometrial lining. So we we're also hungrier. So honor that. Don't try to white knuckle it and just eat the same calories that you were last week. Like give yourself a little bit, like have a little bit more celery, have a little bit more kale, have a little bit more um, foods that are going to or more protein or more fat foods that are going to make you feel nourished and full, um, without any, um, I like to say like cutting the energetic cords, right. Without any guilt or shame around it. All right. You mentioned that, um, maybe eating continuously is an eating disorder. And certainly for the last year and a half, um, with COVID-19, I've seen uh, a number of patients that have put on what I call the COVID-19. Right. Um, and I'm, I'm <laughs> sure you've seen that as well. Uh, because there, I think there is a lot of stress eating uh, for, for obvious reasons. Uh, where does stress p fall in and managing stress fall into your program? I think that I, that was chapter two in the book. It was right after my intro. It's that important to me. I think that we often dismiss stress like it has to, you know, someone's stressed if they're screaming at the top of their lungs and they're red in the face and stress doesn't look like that. You know, if, if, if you have chronic low grade stress or like we think about in the, in the pandemic with people being at home and isolated from each other and it's a very scary world and we, every the rules are changing every single day. That can be an incredibly laborious, um, amount of stress on the body to try and process. So that's the absolute first thing, um, that we talk about, um, in the book is really trying to get your stress levels, right? And there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. I mentioned uh, meditation, who I was uh, introduced to this uh, through Emily Fletcher, yep. who I know We've is um, her on our podcast. Yep. Yeah, she's wonderful. Um, her program Ziva has been a game changer for me. I, I meditate every day because of Emily. And I have no I've noticed I'm a different person. Um, after I, I just know I just get that extra 
um, space in between, like when I want to react and versus when I do react, like that meditation just allows for that frontal lobe flex, you know, for me to be like, hold on, don't, don't yell at your kid. Just, just wait, just calm, just, just a minute, just a minute. And, you know, I homeschooled my kids last year. I didn't want them going to school with masks and I, you know, have, um, you know, certain feelings about that. And I, I said, well, I'm just going to hire a tutor and I'm going to do it myself. So I had that and I had like, I was very stressed as well. So meditation saved me (laughs) last year. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different strategies that we talk about. I talk about the two X breath that Emily, uh, taught us, which is more of a vagus nerve activation where you inhale, you know, or you exhale rather twice as long as you inhale. And there's a lot of other ways, um, that you can, that you can mitigate stress. I think that as a society, we are very, scared of our feelings. We run away from them. We dive into our work. We dive into other things in order to avoid the way that we're feeling. So I go through in some of the chapters, evening and morning routines that you can do to help buffer um, your stress response and to help bring down your cortisol levels in the evening when that's important. And when you need to, when you need cortisol up is you need it right in the morning when you wake up. So I talk about different strategies around um, you know, uh, uh, gratitude practices and journaling. And I, one of the things I I talk about, which has been a game changer for me, I've done this over the past several years is just making the inside of my home look like nature. So, you know, I live in Toronto, as I mentioned, we get all four seasons here in winter. It's dark, you know, it's like, it's dark at like five o'clock. And that means that all the lights in my house are off at five o'clock. We have dinner by candlelight, you know, so things like that, that really help to, you know, again, back to that circadian rhythm of light and its impact on the brain and reducing, you know, that physiological stress response. So, um, yeah, I could talk a lot about stress. I think that it's, it's, it's super important and it has everything to do with your hormones. It'll affect your menstrual cycle. It'll affect your sleep. It'll affect your reactivity. It'll affect your, your partner. If you have a, you know, a romantic partner, it'll affect your relationship as a parent, your, you know, with your parents and your children, if you have them. So really becoming awake to, your triggers and how you become activated, I think is really, really, really profoundly important. So I want, I want to kind of finish up with another uh, pet peeve of mine. And that is women, uh, I have two daughters and I have a wife. Uh, so I, I guess I've been trained properly, but uh, women get short shrift uh, when they have complaints or when they have issues that they want their health care provider to look into. And quite right. frankly, I, I see that every day. Uh, a lot of times health care providers uh, toss this off as depression or you're a mother with two kids uh, and you're you know, 40 years old. What do you expect? Uh, and they don't want to do the blood work. They don't want to listen. How, how do you how do we get the word out to empower our female listeners that this is not the way it should be? Yeah. I mean, I, I think data is always key. So one of the best things that you can begin to do is to track your own, if you are still in your reproductive years, tracking your cycle so that when you do go to these appointments with your, you know, medical doctor or your primary, whoever it is, you can say, look, look at this data. Like, you know, for the last eight months, I've had a length of cycle like this and now it's changing. And now I, you know, so you can go in with some concrete data Um, I'll borrow from Dr. Aviva Ram, who was on my podcast. She's a midwife and a medical doctor. And she was talking a lot about this dismissal in, um, for women's medicine in general. This is like a historical problem. Uh, we've just sort of always been looked at even the word hysterical, you know, when you say, oh, she's hysterical, even that word, I'm a bit of a word nerd. If you look at the root of hist, like, you know, hysterectomy, yeah. hyster- hysterical, we're talking about the uterus, the womb, right? Yeah. So <laughs> the womb, exactly. So one of the things, uh, Dr. Rom, uh, advised, which I thought was profound is, if you have a, you never want to go into a medical, you know, you never want to go into your, whoever your PCP is. You never want to go into your appointment and be like, listen, Dr. Gundry said that I should be doing this. And if you don't, like you never want to go in with this sort of combative, you know, because all that's going to do is it's going to put that practitioner, like they're human, that's just going to put them on the defense, right? So you want to, you want to go in and say, Hey, you know what? I was just thinking like, just as a total complete package, maybe we could explore what my hormones might look like like, 
Uh, and this is why, you know, maybe bring in a paper or two, um, Another thing that would be really useful is maybe bringing in an advocate with you. So uh, a female advocate is preferred. Um, sometimes, um, if, you know, maybe you bring your partner if, if your partner's male, and there and if the and if the doctor's male, there can be this kind of like weird like male bonding thing that can happen, and then it can you know, you know the woman is just end, essentially getting bullied. Um, so I would say bring in a female advocate if that's possible for you, and then the other. Uh, piece again, borrowing from Dr. Rom is don't get undressed until it's time for the exam. You know, sometimes when you're waiting in the, in the, in the room, they'll say, you know, the nurse or someone will come in and say, here's the gown, right? Um, saying something like, thank you so much for the gown. I'm just going to wait until I have a conversation with the doctor before I get into the gown. Because if the doctor comes in, you're like, you know, your, your rear is exposed, you know, you're already in this gown. There's already this power differential yeah. and you're much less likely to say, Hey, this is what I, came in for. Um, and the last piece I'll say is like, just bring something to write on, right? Bring your questions that you already had, uh, pre-prepared so that you don't forget, right? Like your doctor and we have to love these, we have to love our doctors, right? Like they're seeing hundreds of patients a day. They only have, you know, 10, 15 minutes with you. Um, another thing that I've often told my females when I'm, when I'm trying to uh, work with their medical doctor is call the office in advance and say, Hey, I would like a longer appointment with the doctor because I have a couple of extra things that I would like to be able to discuss with her or him. And that's going to help so that the doctor's not like looking at their watch saying, Oh my God, I have 20 other people and I'm an hour behind. Right. So if you give the office an up, like, you know, a bit of a runway and say, Hey, I, can we book a longer appointment? Is there other times in the week that they take longer appointments? You're also going to be respecting, you know, the way that the doctor is running their clinic and you're not coming in sort of all guns a blazing, right? Like my grandmother used to say like a bull in a China shop, right? Like you want to come in delicately respect the person in front of you. They are a human after all. And try to, you know, get what you want with love. Like it's like the old saying, you know, you get more with honey than, you know, you attract more bees, bees with honey than you do with vinegar. vinegar that's yeah. true. Yeah. All right. So uh, where can people find out more about you? Obviously, you can probably get your book wherever you can find books. Yeah. So any online retailer you can find, the book is called The Betty Body, A Geeky Goddess's Guide to um, Intuitive Eating, Balanced Hormones, and Transformative Sex. So Amazon and Walmart and Barnes and Noble, all the places. Uh, you can find, uh, I have a podcast that I'm really excited to be hosting you on very soon. You're going to be coming on The Better with Dr. Stephanie show. So we have, you know, a weekly podcast um, that you can, you know, check me in my workout. And um you can, you can find me on the gram. You can find me on Instagram. I'm fairly active on Instagram as well. So that's at Dr. Stephanie Estima. Great. Okay. Uh, I warned you that we have an audience question and uh, I'm going to let you have first dibs on this one because it's right up your alley and mine on Instagram at Sheer Southard. I think I got that right. Uh, Ask, if you want to lose weight, but like ice cream, which is more effective, non-dairy, sugar-free, with 240 calories, or regular ice cream with 120 calories? Okay, um, here's, here's our female expert on weight loss and ice cream. All right, so Cher, I think her name yeah, is? Yeah, I think it's Cher. I hope. Cher, so I would... So a couple, of, I have a couple of questions that are not answered, but assuming that the portion size is the same, uh, that she's having, you know, maybe she's not having this every single night as a, you know, a, a tool for numbing, but maybe this is like a treat on the weekend. Um, and she's going for that walk after, maybe she's going for a walk after her ice cream. Um, I'm, I'm much more, I like fat in my food. Whenever I have like a fat free yogurt, like I'm in the, I'm, my face is in the fridge 20 minutes later. So I would definitely go for the, um, the ice cream that has the higher fat content, preferably higher fat with lower sugar. So just from her description, it sounds like the 240 calorie one, non-dairy sugar free with 240 calories would probably be the one that I would choose. Um, I'd have it last in your, you know, if you're having, you know, your, your dinner, I'd have that last. It's, it's pure sugar, right? So go for a walk afterwards. And then I would just watch portion size as well. I think that when we're trying to eat healthy, um, it's not that you need to hit the mark a hundred percent of the time. I'm really a bit more 
flexible and there's a little bit more ease, like as long as you're doing well, 80% of the time, of course you can enjoy a glass of wine here and there, you know, a a bowl of ice cream as she's describing. Um, but there's some ways that you can, that you can, um, help to reduce the impact that it's going to have on your physiology. The walking would be, um, one of them. Of course you can always, um, you know, you can always, jump into a resistance workout if you can afterwards or the next day. Um, or you can, you know, you can have a fast the next day as well. Like we, we often, uh, you know, we feast, right? So the ice cream would be like a feast. It's like really easy, you know, uh, calories coming in and you can always, always just jump into a fast the next day as well. So, um, so that would be my answer. I think that calories do matter. We do want to make sure that um, the seems like the regular ice cream with 120 calories is about half of that. Um, so again, you want to make sure that the portion control there is um, like the portions are, are equivalent. Um, so calories do matter, but I think it's okay to have a bit of a refeed every now and then as well if you're doing all the other things that we've been talking about for the past hour. Well, I'm going to answer that question by taking you back to Italy, where you where we started this, and you and I. Uh, so in Italy and France and Spain, the gelatos or the gelées are in very, very, very tiny cups. And That's right. They are yep. concentrated flavor. They are luscious, fat-laden things, and particularly in Italy and France, they're made with A2 milk rather than A1 milk, which is another favorite subject. So I think we can learn, and, and they actually are walking most of the time while they're eating their gelato. And uh, interestingly enough, a number of my patients who think they're lactose intolerant come back from Italy and say, guess what? There's no lactose in Italian gelato. And I said, <laughs> well, yes, there is. Oh, but I can eat it and I feel fine. I said, yeah, because yeah. it's a different breed of cow. Uh, right. But yeah, so right. we should learn that, you know, these things in, you know, in concentrated pleasure is kind of what we're w wanting, not the oh, I'm going to take home a quart and finish it off and it only has 100 calories. You, we're not going to get the pleasure out of that. We really aren't. And it's these little things that we can take away and, and take a walk with that are far better off for you. So, Agreed. So we Agreed. just came around back to Italy. All yes. right. So Take me there. That little piece of dolce, that little dolce there, in the evening. There you so go. lovely. There yeah. You go. As long <laughs> as we walk. All right. As long as we walk. Well, it's great having you on the podcast uh, and hope to see you on your podcast soon. And. Uh, See you soon. Thank you. It's just been a pleasure. You have so much energy. It's just been a joy talking to you today. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, pleasure. And, and good luck with the book. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye. All right. It's time for our review of the week from iTunes. Reverend Mr. Lane has a review and question combo. He says, I really appreciate tuning into your broadcast every week. I have adjusted my eating schedule to closer to a six hour window, and I'm very happy with that so far. I'm also reading The Energy Paradox, and I am very excited about that. I have a question for you, sous vide cooking. What do you think about it? Is there a way to reduce or eliminate certain lectins using a sous vide? I'm curious as to whether there has been much research into this yet. Uh, I'll keep tuning in and I hope you get to my question. Well, Reverend Mr. Lane, uh, we got to your question and thank you very much for your review. Uh, as many of you know, I'm friends with uh, a number of James Beard award-winning chefs and Michelin starred chefs and I like to hang out with them and learn their techniques and certainly a number of them really enjoy and benefit from the uh, meat tenderizing aspects of sous vide. And for those of you who don't know, you basically seal whatever you're going to cook, whether it's a cut of beef or a duck breast, in essentially a sealed plastic bag and you put it in a very low temperature controlled boiling water, for lack of a better word, and you cook it for a very extended period of time at very low temperatures. And then you finish it by quick cooking. And what it does is it makes the most melt-in-your-mouth tenderized thing that you can imagine. 
Now, I'm, I'm glad you asked this question because as a general rule, long, slow cooking uh, does not have the temperature or the pressure to destroy lectins. I have, quite frankly, never seen a paper uh, talking about the effect of sous vide on uh, breaking down lectins, but certainly long, prolonged cooking, like the equivalent is braising in a way, certainly breaks proteins down. So I, I doubt if it'll work, but I wouldn't count against it. And after your question, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look, uh, like I said, I'm not aware of a paper, but I'm gonna look again. And thank you for tuning in, and as you know, please, please, please put your questions and your reviews on iTunes, and maybe like the good Reverend Mr. Lane, uh, I'll be talking to you soon. And I appreciate your questions, because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. Mm -hmm.